Okay, looks like we just became live. Um, hello, Internet. It's been a little while since our last update. I've got um, a number of the team members here with me, so maybe we'll start by doing introductions. Um, first, we have uh, Sausen, our CSO. Sausen, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Sausen Youssef. As Jake said, I'm the CSO of Distributed Bio, and um, I I'm an immunologist by training, so I'll be talking about immunology-related aspects of the stream. <laughs> cool. And then we have Cindy, our director of biosensing and high-throughput molecular interactions. So, Cindy, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Cindy Liao. I am uh, the director of um, biosensor and high-throughput protein interactions and distributed bio. And um, my training is on biochemistry and chemistry. We also have with us uh, Ganjemi. He's our director of virology. He's in the middle of a uh, thunderstorm, so hopefully you he can hear us okay. Ganjemi, are you there? I can hear you fine. Thanks. I'm Dave Ganjemi. I'm director of uh, virology with Sensivax, and uh, my background is really in uh, host immunity and uh, clinical virology. Great. Then we have uh, Jack with us. He's a scientist at Distributed Bio, and uh, you've heard of his work on the COVID-19 program. Jack, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jack. I'm a senior scientist here at Distributed Bio. My background is in, in structural biology and biochemistry, as well as protein engineering. Cool. So the idea with the group of people I brought here together was that um, all of you were uh, heavily involved in the work over the last couple of months. And particularly, I thought, since we just had the press release around the the findings at three independent laboratories, uh, the Department of Defense, U.S. Amarid Laboratory, the Na Galveston National Lab at UTMB, and then Stanford University with Peter Kim's lab, all showing that our antibodies were neutralizing. I thought it would be interesting for people to kind of go behind the scenes um, to some of the most terrifying weeks of my life <laughs> and, and just talk about all of our experiences, both the scientific, what it was like for us to go through that process of reaching this point, and kind of the you know, what it was like personally as well as scientifically and, and some of the thoughts we have around what it takes to engineer a medicine and jump through these kinds of hoops. Um, I invited all of you in because each one of you had sort of a, a critical involvement. So maybe each one of you can just talk a little bit about kind of what, what you've been doing on this project for the, for the last couple of months. Um, I guess, uh, Cindy, you want to start? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so my, my team is, um, we are uh, the biosensor um, team and we look at um, protein interactions by using um, label the, um, we use surface plasma resonance or biolayer interferometry which is a technique that um, measures interactions in real time so um, Jake when Jake back in February he approached me he told me about the COVID-19 program and he mentioned that um, Bocharat and Jack will be generating um, millions of antibodies and through their Tumblr and Superhuman platform. Um, so we needed to find a way to identify uh, specific positive hits um, against COVID-2 and that there are high affinity as well. So that's where my team comes into place. Um, we look at um, how the antibodies interacts with COP2 and if whether they're associate or dissociate at a higher affinity and fast rate. Cool. Yeah. So then maybe we'll talk with uh, Sausen next. So if you want to, Sausen, you've been, uh, fair to say, pretty busy over the last couple of months. Well, what's been your involvement and your, your experience with that? So um, actually, my involvement was. Um, to generate or to express, once we, we knew of the final uh, tens of candidates that we wanna proceed for testing, um, we and my team, uh, Valerie and Joyce and Dylan and many others in the team, with the help of Jack, Sherrod and everybody, um, generated those antibodies. Basically they made the construct to to go and, and make those antibodies. And we actually, because we have the cell department here, we took these constructs and we we made big amounts of all of these antibodies at once. 
and we had to um, um, it, study their property to make sure they they behave well. They're good antibodies. They are not um, having any issues of um, different um, properties that not consistent with the antibodies and we generated those antibodies, we tested them, we sent them to the five lab or the three laboratories that were supposed to do the testing in order to make the testing. Got it. And then uh, Jack, if you're there with us, you, you've been involved in this since the beginning. You wanna tell everybody kind of what you've been involved in? Yeah, so uh, my primary responsibility in the beginning of the project is to create and redesign the antigen that we believe are critical for the virus entry into our cells and use that as our bait to identify potent antibody that could be functional and also neutralizing so that it can be a potential cure for our um, anti-COVID antibody therapy. Cool, and then again, Jimmy, uh, if you can tell a little bit about your involvement in the process. Yeah, my, my job has been to work with primarily the two labs that are doing the uh, plaque neutralization and uh, in vivo animal studies. And uh, that uh, is at uh, USAMRID, uh, United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases at Fort Detrick, Jay Hooper. And uh, we uh, worked with him uh, to set up the plaque neutralization on, on live uh, SARS-CoV-2 SARS virus. And uh, we're also working now on looking at animal challenge in, in hamsters to see uh, how the uh, uh, clones that uh, have been produced will uh, neutralize uh, virus in vivo. So we've got uh, both in vitro as well as in vivo data coming back from uh, USAMRID. And uh, likewise, we have uh, replicated uh, the data from USAMRID with the University of Texas Medical Branch in uh, in Galveston. And again, we're looking at uh, neutralization of, uh, of the live virus, wild type virus, as well as uh, protection in, in hamsters. And uh, so far, um, the clones uh, that are our top candidates uh, look to be very good in both the in vitro plaque neutralization as well as the in vivo uh, protection uh, studies. Might also say that uh, Stanford has done still a third assay. It's a little different assay with pseudovirions, but essentially has confirmed everything that we've shown with our top uh, our top clonal picks. Cool. So I'm going to summarize that for everybody who's not scientists. Uh, this is my <laughs> snappy dumbing down of the smart stuff that my team does. Uh, Jack built a little piece of the virus that our antibodies react to and he produced it really carefully and he engineered some tags that we can grab onto that protein and stick it to magnetic beads and play with it in other ways. Uh, he worked with Cindy a lot, both to characterize that protein, so he uses these instruments to detect whether molecules are interacting with each other successfully, and that's critical because we're making antibodies that are supposed to interact with that little piece of the virus protein that Jack was making, so she checked on that, and then her team also checked on all the versions of the antibodies. We made these billions of versions of those antibodies, we narrowed it down to thousands that we thought were probably the best binders, and then her team checked that. Um, then Sausen gets involved on making sure that these molecules are converted to their final form of an IgG and make sure that they have a lot of the therapeutic qualities that we need. So these things need to not stick to human cells, need to be produced cleanly, and she managed the teams of, of production and characterization of those clones. Uh, and then. Ganjemi is, as a virologist, is engaging with our, uh, the teams at these three sites, um, having conversations with them to make sure that the assays that we are comfortable and happy with those assays and are, are coordinating those conversations uh, and planning to go into the hamsters as well. So that's how we uh, all work together while I ran around like a chicken with my head cut off trying to keep everything uh, juggled at the same time. So I thought it would be kind of fun uh, just because I think science normally is just hidden behind these kind of, you know, these, these walls where you don't really hear the story. What you get is this final paper at the end. Most people can't even read it unless you're trained in that specific discipline. And the, the, how the, like, how the sausage is made behind the scenes is lost. And so I thought that might be an interesting thing for everyone to learn about. How, how do we make a medicine? Uh, and particularly because it was kind of exciting and terrifying over the last few weeks, because um, we had a hiccup. 
uh, along the way towards getting towards the positive result. And I'll talk a little bit about that experience and kind of our experience on how we handled it as scientists, how we triaged a solution and ultimately came up with a, a positive outcome. Um, so I'll start. Uh, so we were gearing up, we'd found those candidates um, using the protein that Jack made of the virus. Cindy's team was determining we had these really good binders. And then Sawson's teams were, were starting to convert those proteins with Jack to uh, the final form, the antibody form. And uh, we got a call from one of the collaborators saying, hey, hey you got to get us stuff really quick. And we're like, well, we're not ready yet. We had one batch going, but we knew there was a problem with that early batch. So you do these little tests and there was an issue with it. But the collaborators like, get it to us now, get it to us now. Like, you know, the world's on fire. And I was saying the same thing. I'm like, guys, guys, we've got to send something out. So we decided to send some, we checked, the, this pilot had problems with it. We decided to send some of those antibodies out to the collaborator. And Cindy looked at it and she's like, Jake, these look heterogeneous. There's something funky. And I was like, you know what? They're so good. They're probably going to work anyway. Just ship it. We could save ourselves a week. Uh, and so I then get a call from Ganjemi and I'm expecting good news. And Cindy's like, yeah, the collaborator says those, we sent seven clones. And they're like, those clones, none of them were, were neutralizers. And I felt like I was going to puke. <laughs> I, tried, I tried to stay on the phone with you again, Jimmy, but I, I was just like, okay, I need a minute. And, uh, and I took a couple of minutes, uh, thought about it, and then I started forming kind of my uh, battle plan. And what I tried to do, and in general, what you try to do in science is you try to do divide and conquer to break a problem up into little digestible pieces. So in my mind, there was three kind of possibilities of what could have taken place. Uh, one was that that batch had problems, that our antibodies were fine, that batch was just an issue, and we kind of knew that that was the case. Um, Cindy had warned me, Jack had warned me, Sawson had warned me, and I shipped anyway because I thought time was so valuable, and I thought we could get away with an inferior batch. Um, the, the second category of possibility was that there was something wrong with the assay being done by the collaborator. And you know, that's a delicate thing to bring up because they're doing you a favor by running the assays. You can't go in and immediately start wagging a finger at them, but you need to start asking questions. And then the other powerful thing we were doing was that we had decided we we're going to send our antibodies out to multiple independent laboratories. So um, if, if it was an assay problem at one lab, the other laboratories would provide a different consistent result. This is the power of independent validation. And then the third more horrifying case would be if there was something fundamentally wrong with the biology that with SARS, an antibody that blocks the ACE2 receptor, that piece of the virus that, that Jack made, uh, that was sufficient to block the virus. But maybe that there was something horrifyingly new about this novel coronavirus where blocking that was no longer sufficient, in which case the antibodies were fine, the assays were fine, but the biology was wrong. And so with that rubric, we decided to attack it on all three fronts to come up with, uh, with a solution. Um, so I'll kind of work backwards along those three. So first, the biology, we had, I kind of talked to Salson and JP and uh, Aishani, Rishi, Rachel, and we kind of, was, we just started looking around and being like, is there, what's the, the evidence right now that the receptor binding domain blockade is sufficient, that ACE2 blockade is sufficient? And Salson, I, what was that like? I called you up and was like, we need to figure that, let's rule this out. Can we rule this out? Uh, yeah, I, I, I thought that it's it has to be something with the antibody, but um, we, we thought about it like it it, it, it will be different if different. if um, the anti the the virus had changed uh, profile and and could now now these antibodies are not gonna uh, attach to where they should supposed to attach, but. In my mind, I knew it's not the case because in that part of the virus, the mutation burden is meaning the virus doesn't change very much. Like for example, the flu, flu virus. So I, I thought it's just the quality of the prep. And so I Jake called me and I'm like, we're on it. We're gonna make a a, a new batch. We're gonna we're gonna check everything beforehand. And uh, sure is I had. I came in the weekend and after we, we finished all prepping all these batches and I tested them again and again and again on, on many, many essays to make sure everything is okay. 
and got them ready to be shipped. And Monday morning, I remember Cindy came and processed all the confirmation. <laughs> we we made sure that nothing is wrong and we shipped them. And um, it was one week where I have to say I lost a few heartbeats. <laughs> and then I knew the essay is gonna start when they initiated it. I believe the first the first group that initiated after they got this prep was a uh, Galveston. So um, you can before we get before we get to the answer, let's review the three. I kind of want to okay. go our, okay. our experience where we don't know the answer yet, and we just want to kind of like how do we yeah. solve into the, the rubric? So the but yeah, sorry, keep everyone suspense. <laughs> so with respect I, to the I, biology. So we did, we found some papers that suggested that when you make antibodies that block the ACE2 receptor, which is the receptor on your body that the, the RBD on the virus, which is what Jack made, binds to to infect your cells, that if you make antibodies to block that, the virus is not able to infect those cells very well. There was other evidence that uh, an ACE2 receptor could act as its own, could neutralize. So there was evidence that that was the only receptor. And we decided to, uh, the, the, you're going to send out that receptor, you could just put into the assay a whole bunch of that receptor. And if you put in a whole bunch of that receptor to block up the virus so it can't bind the real receptor on your cells and it still infects, that means the virus has some evil secret backdoor and we wanted to rule that out. So, and we thought okay. after reviewing the literature, we're like, that probably isn't the problem, but at least we have an experiment to test it. And it was a, an important question because if the virus has a secret backdoor, it means our antibodies could be perfectly good, but they wouldn't be enough. And that, so that was a terrifying possible outcome, but after reading the literature, we're like, that's probably not it. Um, so then comes to the second question, which is the assay. Um, so again, these are our collaborators. They've agreed to work with us on this, on a critical problem. And, and we need, to, you know, you always need to be respectful of people and, and make sure that we're not going into something they're an expert at and accusing them of messing something up. But we do want to ask questions to understand the, the assay. So uh, we got in a call with a collaborator who's been awesome. And we just checked in and asked a series of questions around the way that assay was set up. And in general, I feel like there were some things we could have done differently, but I think we were pretty satisfied with the assay. So that, that collaborator was doing the tough experiment. They were putting live virus, like real coronavirus, in the biosafety containment, so like the spacesuits, uh, And they were then putting in the antibody and see if the antibody would block the virus from infecting human cells. And so Dan Jemmy, we had those conversations with them. And uh, your feeling was that we, we could go a little bit higher concentration just to test. That was also useful and awesome. But in general, we thought the assay sounded reasonable, right? Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, so at that point, the the strategy was to uh, to check the antibodies. So we knew there was an issue with that batch. And the, the issue here was something called bacterial contamination. Um, this was a pilot. We were running things quickly. We were running small batches. And you, when you're growing antibodies, you're growing them in mammalian cells. If any bacteria gets into that flask, it's going to mess everything up. It's going to chop up the antibodies. It's going to cause bad production. And we knew this was happening but we had some some of the flasks seen close enough that I was like, we could save a week. So I, in retrospect, made a mistake. Um, we should have just waited a week longer rather than freak out our collaborator. Um, so, but at that point, I think we all looked at it and we said, let's make a new batch. Um, and we made the new batch and then we got a hold of it. What was the, you, you told me before it was like pretty heterogeneous, heterogeneous yeah. and where this one looked like much cleaner. It was much cleaner this time around. We took the time to carefully, Sasson took the time to carefully in her team um, to make them. And then when she handed it to me, it was much way cleaner. So and it was very specific as well. It wasn't sticking as much um, as the previous batch. So there's this thing that, that Cindy looks for where she can tell if an antibody, like one antibody should bind in a very specific way and kind of bind on at a certain rate and mm -hmm. fall off at a certain rate. Right. We were seeing something that was a stain when it was binding. It wasn't coming off all the way. So that's um, that was telling me that the sample was um, heterogeneous or aggregated. Yeah. So that basically told us that we think we had a better batch. Also, just I... If you have weak antibody binders, then you're never sure what you might be dealing with. But uh, these were such amazing looking binders on all the work we've seen so far from Jack and Cindy's work that I was like, there's no way these aren't good. I kind of just wanted to double down. And so we produced that new batch. It looked good. And then 
we also, I was like, I think there, there was an issue with that batch. Let's double down and we let's send out the antibodies to all the collaborators. So we sent our antibodies out to five groups. Um, the three you've heard about in the press release and there's other two that are gonna be reporting back in soon. Uh, so the other two are Sinobiologicals in China and the uh, University of Kent uh, laboratory there that we're collaborating with and they also won a Gates grant. Um, the two international labs took longer because of shipping. Um, and that's part of the reason, by the way, why I like to send things out to multiple groups. Um, you notice that my strategy is that if, if you want to make sure you storm the castle, every river you run into, you build multiple bridges across it. Uh, that's what we did when we picked five starting antibodies uh, that were anti-SARS, because I wanted at least one of them to cross successfully to the novel coronavirus. All five crossed, but some crossed better than others. So we had some losses and we still got to the other side of the river. Now I wanted to send those antibodies out to five different laboratories. And again, we had some losses. We had delays in shipping internationally uh, and we had this initial scare, but I think sending it out, doubling down and sending that new batch out to all three labs, as well as the, the other two, they're still waiting on results. Um, it protects us because it means that the, you're gonna, if I don't trust anybody's work hundred percent. I don't trust my own hands hundred percent. So I want independent groups using slightly different um, assays, slightly different people, different labs, different equipment, they should all come to the same conclusion. Otherwise, if you have enough people testing it, you can see whoever the odd one out is probably made a mistake. And so it protects us from local issues or material. And, and so we sent it out to those labs and you're biting our nails. And we're fortunate that the, the lab that we sent the first set to were willing to go test more antibodies because we literally sent them seven antibodies and wasted their time. So I felt bad about that. But the second time around, uh, it worked better I'm from Ganjami. Were you the first one who got the update from? Was it Peter Kim's lab, or it was the same morning? Right, it was Kim's lab, UTMB, yeah. and and then US Amherst all started reporting back in around the same time. It was all all at yeah. the same time. It was all at the same time, and and uh, I virtually got a call from Jay Hooper in the BSL four suite, and uh, it was, <laughs> we've, got, we've got some hot clothes. Nice. and so he was very very excited and. Uh, of course, working in the BSL-4 uh, suite is, is very difficult. And uh, whenever you get success like this, it wasn't just one clone. It was several clones that had very, very good uh, reactivity. I got a call from Peter Kim, and he's like, hey, Jake. So he's like, what were, what did, what were the controls in those plates? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, some of those things are blazing. What are you guys using as controls? And I'm like, no, those aren't controls, man. Those are antibodies. So they had these like super strong ones. Uh, same thing at, at UTMB, the, uh, the National Laboratory at Galveston, they, uh, again, they were doing that live virus test and they saw that there were some really potent clones in there. Uh, and the really exciting thing is that all three labs were agreeing on the same clones. That means that the three independent groups using different equipment and materials and people and labs and different cells and cell setups, were all coming to a consistent conclusion, which means you can trust it. And that's, when in a moment like this, in a crisis where time, like money is cheaper than time, it's absolutely worth doing something like that. And that got us out of that, that horrifying hole. It lets, it, it also all, they all tested the uh, ACE2. We put ACE2 just by itself. And when, when you cover up the virus with ACE2, it's not infectious anymore, which means it doesn't have a secret backdoor that blocking that is sufficient. So we kind of nailed all three aspects of our rubric and we were back in that. Um, so that was, that was it. You know, basically at that point we knew we had a pretty potent set of antibodies. We're down to kind of our five super favorites. And then there's some other ones that are pretty good. And some of them are ultra potent. Like you can dilute the living hell out of these things and they still block the virus from being able to infect human cells. Um, and so we have started hamster studies. So two of the labs are taking one of our favorite clones that early was, it's the one we had material for in the beginning of those five. It was one of our favorites and they've uh, given it to hamsters. We're testing both a uh, therapeutic approach where hamsters were you know, kind of sprayed in the face with the novel coronavirus. And then afterwards, like a day later, they get our antibody and we check whether it uh, protects them from the developing viremia or lung, lung pathology. There's some other things that they keep an eye on. And then there's another group that's doing prophylaxis. So they give the antibody first and then they expose them to the virus. So we're interested in both of those because those, uh, both of the kind of clinical settings we're interested in, but also with these sorts of experiments, you kind of want to get a, a salsa, right? You kind of want to get a range to be able to detect it. Yes. Yes. You, because the 
biology of the animals is going to be different from humans. So you want to collect as much as data as you can in order to make some assumptions from your preclin. It's called preclinical, meaning it's the it's experiments done in in models that will help identify which one we want to take forward to the clinic and which doses we want to start our trial. So these are experiments are really important and has to be many ranges in order to get to the conclusion very quickly. Nice. So that, that basically gets us, uh, that's what I, I want to see happy hamsters. Like as soon as I see happy hamsters and it could be as early as next week, we're going to be able to give you some exciting results on that. That's when the first lab is going to give us our results. Another lab, I think actually both labs are going to report in about the same time. Um, that really sets us in place because we already know that these antibodies block the virus from being able to infect human cells, even if it, they're very dilute, so they're very potent. Um, but I just want to see that same thing happen in an animal. Um, we've done some special engineering on these antibodies, so we've tweaked them so that they don't recruit macrophages or skew macrophages in the lungs. And so we think we've actually made them safer also. And I don't know whether we're going to be able to see that kind of readout on the hamsters, although I think... So you, you guys seen that the Hong Kong study did describe some lung pathology. They saw a reduction in viral burden, but continued lung pathology, which leads me to believe we may be able to see some of that macrophage skewing effects here with the LALA mutations. What, what do you all think about Like, Are we going to see that? Or is it comparable? It's not, we didn't do an R control arm without LALA in the study. We All we have to compare to is the original Hong Kong reporting on the model. So... The most important thing here is yeah, we'll to... Yeah, soon, we'll soon know uh, the results, the histopathology is uh, going to be coming out in the next uh, next few days here, early this early this next week. So we'll, we'll know whether or not there's any uh, histopathology uh, associated with it. Uh, hopefully there isn't, and uh, hopefully there isn't a lot of, uh, of inflammation in, in their lungs. As you say, Jake, it's, it, we hope that uh, we're going to see at least a two, three log reduction in the overall virus titers in the lungs of, of those infected animals. Nice. So in parallel, so here's what our life has been like recently. So we now have these five leads um, that is now shifting our attention on a couple directions. So uh, one is... Uh, rushing those as quickly as we can while maintaining safety uh, and the limit, the fundamental limits on how long it takes to get things done in pharma um, to a human trials. And we'll talk about that time frame. And again, I'm going to tell you yet another way that we're building multiple bridges across the river. Because now the first river was getting an antibody that crosses the coronavirus. So we built multiple tumbler antibodies uh, and then superhuman and we got across the river. Next river was making sure we had robust newts. And so we sent our lab antibodies out to five labs and we got that result back. Now it's in vivo, we send it out to two labs, we're getting that result back. Uh, and next is getting the material through manufacture to go into clinic. And so we're exploring two and potentially three different technologies to drive our molecules forward. The first is called China, Chinese hamster ovaries. It's a coincidence that we're talking about hamsters twice. They're just a cell that people use to produce antibodies. Um, it takes a long time. Uh, a second is a technology, and I'm hoping to be able to announce this within a week, with a new partner that has a much faster cell-free or bacterial-based method for uh, producing uh, antibody therapeutics. And they could, they could potentially make us uh, significantly faster. And uh, once that partnership is in place, I'll be able to announce that. Uh, it's riskier because this is, hasn't been done before. But I think if there's any time for innovation, it's now. And we're going to have the Cho thing going. We're just going to try this as well. And the third are... Uh, fungal-based expression system. So we literally are picking like different forms of life and being like, okay, let's try many different forms of life with different timelines and risk profiles. And we're going to push our drug through all of them in parallel. Uh, there's another even fourth one. At this point, we have these molecules and people are super interested in talking to them about. So it actually doesn't cost us anything for me to go put little bets on weird technology. So we're talking to a company that's got a pretty far out there technology. I'm not even going to tell you about it yet, but it doesn't, it, it, it's no risk. As long as we have Cho lined up, we have the faster self slash bacterial system, and then we have this third uh, yeast the system, I can go try out this crazy things, and if they work, great, and if they don't, we, we've got a path forward. So that's sort of the position in terms of uh, manufacturing. Um, in parallel, maybe we'll talk a little bit about, since we've got Jack and Cindy here, we have a continued engineering arm. So we have these five presumed leads, and at this point, 
there's a point where you don't want to muck around anymore because you need to go into manufacturing. There's, that's, that's a limiting step. But there's ways you can fold back in a superior molecule later. And so maybe, Jack, you want to talk a little bit about your yeast platform and kind of what you've been doing on that to explore cross-reactivity and further affinity? Yeah, so kind of taking advantage of what we have already discovered through the superhuman and the Tumblr technology. Um, we also try to utilize a slightly different alternative to try to figure out uh, whether or not we're able to target the whole coronavirus family. So that way it will be only broadly neutralized on top of what we're already seeing that crosses to um, the older SARS virus variant. And so what we're trying to do essentially is redesign another RBD from other species and then try to bake them and train those antibodies in a way that is displayed on yeast so we can further target them to make sure that we can contribute to the same amount of potency, specificity, as well as hopefully the neutralization as well to those old class of coronavirus. Uh, great. So yeah, they're basically we're aiming to take what we currently have, because we still have these hundreds of millions that we uh, versions, uh, many of which cross, and we can use this yeast display platform to carefully tease apart the, the most cross-reactive ones or find even more advanced mutations. We also have the computational group. So uh, JP, um, working with Aishani and Rachel, uh, have been analyzing the, uh, the whole bunch of sequences that emerge after Tumblr, and they've implicated a series of additional mutations that they think might crank our antibodies like up to 11 and make them even more potent. So we already know these things are super potent. Cindy's done pretty, I, mean, I thought it was pretty interesting. The experiments on single chain FB, then over uh, at IgG, including at 37 Celsius, which is like actual body temperature. Mm -hmm. So Cindy, for everyone's benefit, if you read a paper and you notice that it's reporting the affinities at 25 Celsius, what does that make you think? Sorry, I couldn't hear your question. Can if I you read a paper on a therapeutic mm -hmm. and people are reporting the affinities at 25 Celsius, what does that make you think? This is, it's not very relevant because your body is at 37. So the affinities will be much weaker at 37. So when they claim it's um, super potent at 25, it could, that potency might be decreased in actual. I mean, that was a problem with um, some of the drugs for the antibody drugs for Ebola. So they, I mean, they, they helped. Now, just to be, to be fair, the antibody drugs against Ebola were absolutely transformational for the, for the disease, but some of them were pretty weak. They were reported at 25. They should have been reported at 37. Mm -hmm. And you could anticipate there was a problem because they had to give people like 10 and a half grams of those antibodies, which is crazy. That's a crazy high dose of an antibody drug. And it's because they weren't that potent. Mm -hmm. uh, and so our kind of our objective here with the engineering that we did was to try to make very potent antibodies up front. There was actually a paper I saw after the Ebola crisis showing that if you could engineer those antibodies um, from Ebola to be higher affinity, you could dose them way less, which sounds obvious, but they actually proved that. And that's the point of a paper. And, and that's sort of work we did up front. So these antibodies are pretty potent. I still wouldn't mind finding another mutation because getting them even higher uh, what it does is the more potent the drug is, the less drug you need to give a patient. And so it gets it easier to give a smaller amount, which if you're getting an IV bag, it doesn't really matter. It mostly affects the cost of production. But if uh, if you get it concentrated enough, and it's awesome, you've been doing concentration tests, uh, mm -hmm. it, we're the beginning of concentration tests, and we're working with the Eric Apple Lab as well, then you potentially could do a subcutaneous injection, which is just a syringe, and they go and they like do a little injection. Like, what do they do? Under the belly fat? Yes. Yeah, and then that's an outpatient procedure. That could happen at old folks' homes. That could happen on, on cruise ships or on military vessels, like from the Navy. Uh, and that could be a practical method for uh, being able to, to widespread deliver an inexpensive medicine uh, in this arena. Cool, so that's basically, anyone else have any thoughts about the, the roller coaster in the last few weeks? So maybe at this point, we'll transition over and go in and start answering some questions from the live audience. Let's see here. I don't see question, or question one. ETA on hamster experiment results. Um, so Dan Jemmy had answered that a minute ago. Uh, basically, we're gonna potentially get some information next week. Um, 
I've been checking my phone like 20 times a day all, all week this week. And then we heard back from one of the club. So one of the collaborators have been dosing. The other collaborator uh, had said that they basically uh, they need to analyze the lung tissue in a couple different ways. And they're working in this biosafety four, which is like, that's where the spacesuits are to protect you so the virus doesn't get you. But you've probably seen that in like Contagion or Outbreak, those crazy movies. That's like actually what our collaborators are doing right now. And in... So what they like to do for some of their experiments is they like to get the stuff outside of the biosafety for facility so they can use other instruments. And so they need to take like tissue slices and then they need to basically make sure all the virus is dead on the tissue slice, but that the proteins aren't so destroyed that they can't analyze them under a microscope or stain them. So they've done, they've done that work. Uh, and that means more people who are not trained. Like I, I, I wanted to go into the biosafety for facility. I was like, can I go, I go in? And I'm sure they would have been like, no, absolutely. You cannot go you know, take some selfies in BSL four. So, they, they have a limited number of people that are allowed in there for very good reason. And then they try to sanitize materials and take them out to test. So that's where we are right now. And next week is when uh, we hopefully get uh, positive results. You know, so we, we tested at 15 megs per keg. So it's not as high. We're going higher with the other partner. Um, but they still showed us that there was, they, they confirmed that there was a good neutralizing antibody um, during the entire experiment in the blood of, of the animal. So, um, I, I am cautiously optimistic that we should, as long as biology doesn't surprise us, we should see happy hamsters next week. Cross your fingers for us. All right, question two. Do you still expect September to be a realistic time frame? Uh, so for the record, end of August is when I really want uh, phase one slash two to start, and that is a wildly unrealistic time frame. So <laughs> let me, so if you use ch uh, CHO, the traditional way of producing IgGs, that is almost impossible to meet that deadline. We have to do this thing called stable pools, and we have to have integrated production, and it's tough. Um, uh, the Cho folks are giving us a longer time frame, and so that's why we're partnering with these other groups that have the bacterial or cell fray system. They they can deliver drug way faster. We just need to convince the FDA that their system is equally good. And they have some very good arguments why drugs have been produced in bacteria pre uh, previously. So that, that's not new. And then we've we've engineer altered the way the antibody is to be able to work in that system. And um, and we did, and there's been similar engineering done by other groups. So we just need to have the conversation with them and mostly convince them that the, the facility they've set up that can process, they tell me like 100,000 doses a month um, is ready for what's called GMP manufacture. And so th those conversations are very aggressively happening right now. If that lines up, then yes, we can meet the time frame. Um, the, the other thing we've been having lots of conversation upon recently is the exact structure of these studies. So we are setting up what's called a phase one slash two study, which is where you start dosing healthy controls and then you, uh, so it's awesome. Do you escalate on the same people or is it like you do the five megs per keg and then seven days later? No, you have to go to a, a new cohort. Each, each, each cohort will be different, different population because the, the first cohort will be still in monitoring. They're going to take blood samples to test the, the uh, activity of the antibody in them. They can't keep dosing them. So each cohort will be a separate population of, okay. of subjects. Yes. So you get a group of people, you give them a, a, like a medium low dose, and then you wait. And after a few uh, enough days have passed, then we were trying to make that the minimum where you don't see any reactions. And antibodies are safe, but you got to check. Then at that point, you give another group of people a next dose up. And as soon as you've proven that each dose ladder level is safe, then you can start dosing patients in hospitals. And so we've got some cohorts set up to be able to start dosing uh, patients that are both moderate folks on admit. Um, a more challenging one is people who are real serious. They might be on ventilators. Now, they need medicine too, but they're also, they have a lot of other problems. So that we, our ideal scenario is like the earlier you get the medicine, the more effective it's going to be. That's uh, what we saw with Ebola. Um, that's what we've seen with rabies. Um, viruses work that way in general uh, for antibodies. Um, so we have these multiple cohorts. Um, normally there's this exclusion set where you basically pick a series of more complicated conditions that people have, and then you don't let them participate in the study. And uh, people do that because they're wanting to protect their statistics. But my concern here with that is that the the people who are at greatest risk of dying are the ones with complications and they're the elderly. And like you, you show me in a group of old people that don't have comorbidity like diabetes or, or previous cancer and stuff like that. So actually what I'm, we're having a conversation over whether we exclude them or we create actually a separate cohort of people that have complications. And then we're just, again, statistically comparing 
that high risk category of people who may stand to benefit the most from the drug compared to another, that, that same category of people who didn't get our drug, they got other standard of care. And I, I think that's the most effective way. I also just don't like the idea of exclusion criteria from like an ethical perspective. I prefer the idea of like we're binning people, but we're not kicking anybody out of the study. Um, but that's a conversation and I may be overruled there. Um, so if, if that stuff lines up, then yes, the, the time frames are still consistent. Um, they're aggressive. This is the, the fastest that I can conceive of doing this. If I can get any faster, of course, we're going to announce it to everyone. Uh, hopefully questions for other people. Question three, are there other companies also close to producing working antibodies? Uh, yeah, there are a few. You guys want to speak to that? All right. Uh, um, sure. Go ahead. Uh, Regeneron. I say that the, there's a lot of groups working on this and you want that to happen. I think the groups that are the furthest along um, kind of our head-to-head -head competition are going to be Regeneron. Those guys did well with the Ebola crisis. Their drug was the best one. They have a good system and um, and they control manufacturing. So they have an advantage from that perspective. Uh, so those guys are barreling along. I think they're going to make a good medicine. Um, there's also a group called Abcelera. There's one called Veer. Um, I know the professor that the beer group works with. He's a good uh, uh, Jim Crow. I'm pretty sure that's where they're getting their antibodies from. He's, he's a good guy. He does good work. Um, and then the Abseller group, I like the cut of their jib. They're a good group also. So I think those are all pretty competent groups. They're going to be um, progressing effective antibodies. And I've heard there's a number of other groups. There's a, a Dutch group who I think found an antibody that um, looked good to me. Those are the ones. And in general, I value the, the groups that are publishing because I think there's a risk here that people are going to just say, oh, yeah, we have an antibody and their stock blips up a bit um, and they benefit from that. So it's kind of a pump and dump sneaky method. So I think the groups that are publishing are showing, yeah, look, we actually have molecules. We're uh, committed to actually delivering something useful that people can can use to alter the crisis. Uh, on that note, we are aiming to uh, uh, publish our study. Um, I would like it to be next week. I'm sure I'm going to freak everybody out by saying that so as quickly as possible. Uh, we're going to put it in bioarchive because we have the IP around these antibodies. Um, so two of the three labs we sent our the, the did the newts contacted us and asked if they could use our antibodies as their standards, their gold standards going forward for their staining experiments and also for the positive controls. Um, that means these antibodies are super solid. We've been reached out by, to by diagnostics groups. And if we publish our results on BioArchive, then it's not five labs we've sent our antibodies out to. It's like 500 labs all over the world. And everyone can see that those antibodies are remarkable in their hands. And they can use them in various ways in laboratories that we're not even thinking of to help forward our understanding of the, of the pathology of the virus. So that's our intention with those groups. Um, I think compared to those groups, uh, I don't really see them as competition. Like we are head to head. I think. The virus is the competition, and we want multiple successful antibodies. In the Ebola crisis, three groups brought antibodies in. It was a good thing because not all three antibodies were equally good. It's my whole multiple bridges across every river problem. We want our doctors, ideally, to have a, a, a palette of possible drugs that they can give to their patients. Um, I think our unique advantages are we didn't just start from scratch. We started from engineering, from antibodies that were worked on from years before. So our antibodies are very potent. They have uh, engineering advantages of thermal stability, good expression. <clears throat> Promise I don't have it. Uh, and we've done some mutations on the constant regions to uh, make them have better half lives and uh, immune damage in the lungs. Uh, well, ideally, we'll see how that works out. Um, we also have a unique pricing model because I don't have a venture capital. Capitalist, right? We're entirely grant funded and profit driven. And then that means that we are in a luxurious position of being able to charge uh, a much more reasonable price for our drug. Um, Cause I don't have uh, shareholders or venture capitalists who are like, cool, you got a drug, let's make billions of dollars. I think what we want to be able to do is make uh, enough money that I don't have to constantly be begging for grants anymore. And to be able to treat the world and make a drug that's just cheap enough that it's accessible to the world because it doesn't make any damn sense to make a drug that works, but it's so expensive that most of the world can't use it because then we just keep having this crisis continue. Um, so I think that's going to be, I think the economics is going to be one of our advantages as well. Okay. Questions for other people. Question four, how can we help from other count countries to accelerate production and clinical trials? Who wants to take that? I guess we did send some of our protein to Guatemala for, if I remember correctly, for them to develop their assay, right? Jake, if you correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah, it's, so it's, I, your, it's your protein. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, so I guess in that sense, um, besides helping other people to accelerate antibody discovery, there's also other application need to be done, such as a more easier or more affordable diagnostic way of doing detecting the viruses, as well as check if people have already immunity to it by doing serology or things. So I think besides what we're good at doing, which is antibody discovery, we're also helping other people by providing what we have already that's good quality so that other people can use the same uh, material to kind of study and also develop their own assays and other experiments. Yeah. So yeah, we're basically enabling an ELISA-based method for assessing the reactivity um, of, of convalescent patients who have recovered from the coronavirus uh, to the receptor binding domain. That's the part of the virus that enables it to infect your cells. And so that's a, we're trying to set it up an assay and with University of San Carlos and Aaron Caldwa and the idea is we're going to open source the assay, so anybody around the world can adopt that assay because that's a, that's a medicine that's available now. You, everybody's got patients. Everyone's got recovered patients, and so a quick screen can tell you which of the patients have good antibodies that you can use as donors to patients who who might need a, a therapy now and can't wait till September or later. Um, one other thing I'll say with the accelerating production in international. Um, so in my mind, there's kind of a three axes of, of need here. One is the drug needs to work. Um, but the second, it needs to be physically available around the world. And the third is it needs to be financially available, so not too expensive. Uh, we've solved the first one well. Our drug works. Um, I will be completely comfortable with that once I see hamsters and then completely, completely once we get to humans. But right now, it's neutralizing the hell out of these viruses. They can't infect human cells anymore. So I feel pretty comfortable. Um, the other two require some innovation. So. Part of the, the cost, really, that's easy. You can just basically come up with a Ford model. I don't have 30,000 employees. I don't need to charge a crazy amount of money to go repay venture capitalists or to maximize my bottom line. Um, I want to make enough money that basically I can use profits instead of grants because that means I can build more medicines faster. But the beauty of that is that there's going to be a lot of doses that are needed for a medicine like this. So we don't really need to charge that much on top of cost of goods. It's the, the Ford model. <clears throat> where you can make large numbers of doses and make them relatively accessible, a few hundred dollars um, at most per, per dose for the final price of the medicine. Um, the, the third problem is literally just pr production. So everybody who produces antibodies goes through these mammalian expression systems. They're these big bioreactors, biovats. They kind of look like beer vats. Um, and there aren't that many of them around the whole world, which means you can actually run into a queue where it's hard to produce your material or produce a large number of it very quickly. And that's part of the reason why I'm trying to produce our drug through both uh, the mammalian bioreactors and also the very different bacterial bioreactors and yeast bioreactors because they use different facilities. So it has different level of capacity and we can produce more of the drug through different avenues. Uh, a final idea we're toying with is the idea of a license that enables nationalized production of our drug. So the idea here is it's a license. A nation can choose uh, to give a grant to uh, one of their own biotechs that have bioreactors in their own country and nations love to give grants to their own their own biotechs They don't like really like giving lots of money to other countries So the idea is look tell you what you just cut off all the production costs Through this license and we're licensing your company to go produce it. They, they cut us a check for, for part of the profit, but they're gonna go uh, Nationalize production and the value of that is many nations around the world are more likely to give grants Which a bunch of that grant goes to their own nation and then they also you have local production taking place and that enables Large numbers of facilities to be activated simultaneously There needs to be some oversight on quality and there also needs to be some management in that license to make sure that one group Doesn't produce more than they need and start price gouging their name uh, But those are things that that licenses are designed to to solve. So that's something we're considering All right Let's see if there's some other questions. Uh, question five, do you have any updates on funding? Uh, coming soon, we, yes. <laughs> uh, we are embargoed on telling you anything about it yet, but we have good something good to announce soon. Um, here we go, question. Is there any concern your antibodies will bind to human angiotensin II, the normal ligand for ACE2, because of the similarity in shape to the spike protein? Who wants to take that one? I can take this one. Actually, sure. not at all. I think angiotensin at that point when it binds the ACE, it's a peptide of nine or 11 amino acids that get cleaves to nine amino acids. The, the uh, 
receptor binding domain where where the virus kind of binds to the ACE is is looped into a three dimensional shape that maybe fits. It, it's basically the ACE is kind of like think about it. It's a hole, and and anything can go in inside the hole. So so um, that that peptide kind of shapes into the into the ACE path and and get cleaved. But but the virus kind of goes and plug the hole like you plug a, a bottle of 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 champagne like really really tight or a bottle of wine so it's it's a little bit different um but but it just mainly it, it's it's completely different structure so i don't anticipate that the antibody is gonna bind to the angiotensin too so no the, it's gonna be specific for the rbd in the of the virus so part of characterizing our antibodies we actually um the competition assay where we characterize if our antibodies um, block ACE from binding to the receptor binding domain of COVID-2. And one of the controls was uh, checking if our antibodies uh, will bind to um, the human ACE2. And that was very clean. So regarding to what Sosan was saying, where she, she doesn't anticipate that they will, if our antibodies will bind to the human angel. Tensing two, it uh, we actually um, tested that in experimentally. When we and that was very clean. When we discovered our antibodies, we made billions of starting versions. And part of our process is when we engine when we're searching in those billions for the best ones, we um, we have a bunch of magnetic beads that have a bunch of double stranded DNA, which is just negatively charged. And we dump that in there, and any antibodies that randomly stick to negatively charged material, we turn on the magnet and pull them away. Then we dump in magnetic beads that have histones, which are arbitrarily positively charged. And any antibodies that just stick generically to positively charged surfaces, we pull those away. Uh, then we heat up the library, we heat the phage up at, uh, to 72 Celsius. So anything that's not thermostable, we get rid of that. Uh, we search specifically against the, the target protein and we deselect against anything that hits the beads without that target. So these are all things that get rid of sticky and nonspecific material. The CDRs we chose came from humans, came from the blood of over 100 subjects, and we were able to in impose those in. So those are being sort of pre-tested on an individual CDR basis against the body, although we're combining them in novel ways. Uh, and then once we got those antibodies back, and, we, and the ones that are the super specific, uh, a couple things happened next. One is Sausen, you ran and you screened those against cells, and cells have yeah, thousands yeah. of proteins mm -hmm. on their surface. And these, so if any, if they stuck against any random uh, protein of any kind, if they were sticky, we would have a uh, a signal and you saw it was, they're basically super clean right very very clean and then the last thing that happened was that one of the labs so utmb contacted us and they said hey we're they were trying to do tissue stains since so they had lung tissue stains of like healthy control hamsters and then hamsters had been infected and they were trying to stain for the presence of the virus and they had this polyclonal a mixture of antibodies they got from a commercial source and it wasn't doing a very good job it wasn't staining the virus very well and it was staining healthy tissue so you couldn't really tell the difference and so I, they contacted us and said, hey, just so you know, we didn't like our internal control, so we mixed some of your antibodies because they were so awesome and they are gorgeous. We want those to be our gold standard. Can we do that? And I was like, hey, which antibody did you choose? They're like, oh, we mixed a little bit of all of them. That means that all of our antibodies mixed together did not stain healthy tissue at all, and they specifically stain viruses. So that, that is a pretty awesome demonstration of the, the cleanness of these molecules. And finally, just a theoretical thing. If you have ACE2 and you have a ligand that binds ACE2, they can, but two different molecules can bind the same receptor with no reference. It's not like a, like lock and key where it's ob obligatory symmetric. You can have radically different molecules all bind the same thing, but they don't have anything um, in similar with each other. So for all those reasons, we think we're in pretty good shape. We still are gonna run safety and talks with Charles River Laboratories. And they're gonna take our antibodies and just like with the hamsters, they're gonna take them and try to stain human tissue, a whole bunch of tissue slices from, uh, from various parts of the body and make sure that they look super clean uh, there. These are all the steps that we take to make sure antibodies look good, but so far these molecules are looking nominal. Um, question seven, what are the risks of, an, of this antibody therapy? So antibody therapeutics in general are very, very safe. It's been proven many times in autoimmune diseases like anti-TNF therapy for arthritis and uh, anti- IL-23 for lupus and psoriasis and all these kind of 
also all the immuno oncology therapies, anti PD one, CTLA four for cancer. So antibody profile in as a therapeutic um, is safe in in in. Um, general versus small molecule that has a lot of effects on other pathway and causes non side effects of non therapeutic. Now ha that has been said, um, there might be side effects of the antibody because of the treatment. But since it's in against a viral, a, a, um, a non um, protein that is in generally in our body, I wouldn't anticipate they're going to be a major. On it's called on target, meaning. Um, it's, it's side effects based because of binding of the target. I, I don't anticipate that because we are treating a non-human uh, um, um, molecule. Um, so I, I, I would be very, very surprised if we saw a lot of adverse effects. Yeah. I, I don't anticipate anything like that. Occasionally with antibody therapeutics, there's some like um, local site interactions, hives, reactivity. That was often because of poorly engineered old medicines or the older ways people engineered antibodies. Or mm -hmm. like Sasson was saying, because those, those antibodies were actually designed to go attack some of some gene that's on your tissues, where this thing's just designed to attack the virus. So it should be sort of silent. Your body's full of hundreds of millions of antibodies and your body ignores them happily. We're just sneaking one in that does a really good job. We've also tweaked it. So we've turned off the part of the, the antibody that recruits the rest of the immune system because with this virus, that's a problem. We're making these antibodies sort of silent. silent. They just go up and clog up the virus and they don't do funky things with the immune response afterwards. Uh, but you still, this is why we run safety. So we're gonna run safety and talks uh, with Charles River and then we're gonna run that phase, phase one study and healthy controls with the dose escalation. This is why we run these things in these ways. And I know it sounds frustrating. I've literally had people being like, why can't you send like my aunt? She's like, well, like, why can't you give your antibody to your aunt? I'm like, first off, we don't have enough material. Second, it's not GMP. And third, there are these steps that we need to do. Like me testing my drug on my aunt would be like, imagine I was wrong. Uh, it sounds pretty safe, um, but the, the it would be basically performing experimentation without testing on, on a family member or like anyone. That would be unethical. So we want to do this in the correct stages. I think we, too, we also have some historical observations, particularly with the Ebola situation in which massive amounts of monoclonal antibody was used. Rabies is another situation in which a lot of antibody is, is pumped in. But in RSV, in, in uh, very young kids, uh, a significant amount of antibody is, uh, is utilized. Mm -hmm. And those have been very safe. Uh, there hasn't yeah. been much in the way of adverse reactions uh, in, in any of those three viral infections following treatment with uh, monoclonal antibody. That's true, yeah. I mean, these are super safe medicines. The, my bigger question is I want to know how effective it is. I think it's very unlikely we're going to see a negative response. The most of the question is, are we going to see... That, that's what the hamsters... That's why I'm very excited to see what happens next week, because I want to know how does this virus respond to the presence of a whole bunch of antibody? And there's been existing literature that's starting to suggest that, yes, antibodies in the hamster studies, convalescent plasma, these things can lower the titer. So we think it could work. But I want to know when you get a super potent antibody, how well is the hamster protected? Because I think that is a decent surrogate of what's going to happen in a patient. All right. Any concerns of virus mutation with respect to uh, efficacy of the antibody? Maybe, Jack, you want to take this one? Sure. Um, I think as far as I have read so far, a lot of the mutation doesn't really occur at the receptive binding domain. Mm -hmm. Usually they are actually occur at either the top of the tip of the spike protein or the actual nuclear capsid that encapsulate the whole DNA information. So because how where we are targeting at the epitope that we're targeting with our antibody, it's very unlikely that if there's unless there's a mutation that somehow triggered the uh, RBD to be something else. Else, which, in fact, if that happened, maybe the virus won't be able to infect the human cells anymore. But if that do happen, then that's the case where our, our antibody will fall. But it's very unlikely that will happen. Yeah. Um, so one thing we are contemplating, so two options. One is we have some antibodies that seem like those more broadly neutralizing epitopes for shared sites that haven't changed from novel coronavirus all the way out to SARS. So those sites may be particularly hard for the virus to mutate. Um, and then another uh, an, another thing we're considering is putting in two antibodies and not just one. And that way, it's like a multi-drug cocktail. Even any single mutation that may occur wouldn't be enough to knock out both. And so therefore, that's, that mutation wouldn't uh, proliferate in that patient. So the drug would be robust to it. So 
those are those are two techniques where when we're balancing that versus speed um, of getting something out that people need right away. And we may choose of those three different expression systems I was discussing to make different calculations on. Maybe have one drug to go as fast as possible that has a single monoclonal with a follow-on that has two clones in it for more robust protection. And maybe two different clones. So even if there is some immunity that emerges against the first drug, we have a mechanism with an alternative drug that will work. With immunity, sorry, immune evasion. Question eight, why are we not seeing more about this and potential treatment in the media? Well, there was a bunch. Um, there were some weeks where I was on Fox and CNN and CSNBC. Like we we're getting so many media appearances I couldn't handle it. I think this last week we released our uh, our press release and I think right around the time we released it, the, the Moderna had just updated that they did this study and they saw eight of their 24 subjects they reported in on the show that they produced uh, neutralizing, or they produced antibody titers after receiving their drug. And I mean, that's good news. Um, their technology is solid and we need a vaccine. So, but I think that's just the timing of it. They released it some hours before us. Um, I think also really the goalpost has changed, I think, which is a good thing. I think neutralizing and in multiple independent laboratories, like that press release was for me to go talk to government from a top down and a bottom up approach and to have all the, basically everyone in the world can now talk to those three labs and check in on our work. Uh, and those labs are happy to, and I'm happy to have people have them tell them what they think because we're, I'm proud of the awesome antibodies my team's created. Um, I think the hamsters is going to be something where that puts us ahead of a lot of the other groups. So probably next week we're going to see more attention. And then also, if we create that partnership with the the partnership with the that fast production team, then that suddenly accelerates our development pro our development, which that's a huge one, right? Because that really makes the difference for how long um, this crisis has no effective therapy in the clinics. Um, big picture, uh, I don't mind it so much. It was kind of like ridiculous how many, the media stuff was kind of ridiculous and it also served its purpose. I think that you guys all um, watched us and reached out and we had these like media engagements and then this community of support. Uh, and I, I really do think that tangibly affected our conversations with multiple government agencies who were like, yeah, we're hearing about you guys from everywhere. Um, and that helped the conversations which we now have engaged and we're pretty soon gonna be able to give up a positive announcement regarding a funding situation. So I think you all helped us get there and I wanna thank you for that. Um, you know, we'll get science famous maybe more later, but right now we just, right now my biggest concern is I need to have that lockdown timeline and I need it shorter than it is right now across every axis to get it into patients. So that, that's where I am. Will you use the five antibodies as a cocktail or separately? So I guess we address that a little bit. we we'll probably do one monotherapy. We might do some cocktail. It wouldn't be all five because it's just production is a pain to produce five antibodies, but we might do, do two. Um, question 10, most of the media is talking about vaccines. What is the plan to get more attention for therapeutics like this? Okay, so I guess that the big question is vaccines versus uh, monoclonals. Thoughts, Cindy? So, um Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. There. Yeah. Is it, my browser is kind of like slow. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's basically reaching out in this way, like this media um, news telling people that there are these other therapies other than vaccine that can reach out to you um, in a faster way than what vaccines could potentially do um, for cures of this. Actually, you know who I'd like to jump in on this question is Shaishani. Can you manifest if you're if you're backstage? Let's see if she I'm jumping in. Hi, Hello. Everyone. I'd like to introduce uh, Aishani. Um, Aishani's been working on us both in using computational immunoengineering techniques, so like machine learning methods to optimize antibodies. Um, She's also been working with me on some of the corporate setup and some of the you know media, but also strategy and finance. So uh, many different areas. Thank you very much, Aishani. She's a puppet master behind the scenes. And I invited you up here because we, germane to that question, we just co-authored an article and we're about to co-author a second one on this topic. Yeah, so I wanted to know if you wanted to speak to it a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, part of the problem right now with this pandemic is we're really, we need people to think on a longer term scale than just tomorrow. And vaccines are really helpful with that because the thing that accompanies the conversation about vaccines is herd immunity. Um, and that's good. And it's important that we're working on this and we're making really good progress. But the small hiccup that you have with the vaccine 
is that you can't use it to treat someone who's currently sick. And that is where a monoclonal antibody is really helpful because not only can you use it as a treatment for people who are currently sick, but you can also use it as a short-term prophylactic and in between while we continue to develop the vaccine. So short answer, both are really important and helpful, viable paths to pursue to combat this pandemic, but it's more looking at a sooner versus longer term solution. And right now we're kind of focusing a little bit more on the big picture, but as we get better at managing the immediate crisis, that's where antibody therapeutics are really gonna come into play and people will want them and need them more and talk about them more. Yeah, so we're planning to go put out an opinion piece uh, pretty soon articulating this point. Um, we have started conversations with some folks at the White House um, and then with uh, government agencies. And I think some of them are familiar. I think the word vaccine was just more in the lexicon. People knew what a vaccine was because it was one of the greatest medical advances since sanitation and fire. Whereas in antibody, you know, it starts getting a little technical. And because uh, like, we get a lot of questions, which is funny because like, I, you know, this is my bread and butter for years of my life. So it's, it's astonishing. I, I forget that people are like, so what is an antibody? And I'm like, oh my God, like three quarters of my brain is dedicated to that. Let me tell you. Um, and so I think there's just like that little bit of a knowledge gap of familiarity of you, you wouldn't immediately, if you're a lobbyist or a policymaker, immediately think, oh, antibody, you immediately think vaccine. And so I think some of that is showing that we need both, that we have a vaccine for treating those who are not yet sick, um, but we need therapies and antibodies are the best choice here in clinic for people who, and, and, and as well as outpatient for people who aren't sick yet. But on that same point though, it's actually relatively easy to cross that knowledge gap because once you explain that vaccines teach the body how to create antibodies against a virus or a foreign invader, instead you're cutting out the middleman and just directly giving a patient an antibody, it clicks really easily. So it's a matter of just one extra step in that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right on. It's basically educating everyone that the process is very similar. It's just yeah. two different ways. Hopefully we are succeeding about in doing a little bit of that here today. Um, I feel like we're at about an hour, so maybe we'll wrap up at this point. I just want to thank everybody, and then I don't know, Yan, can we pop you up? Yan, can we pop you up a little bit as well? I just want to thank uh, Apex for working with us. Oh, look at this! Boom! There's the man. How's it going? <laughs> um, just want to thank uh, Apex for all the work behind the scenes, enabling us to stream this stuff across multiple different platforms simultaneously, and then just in general, all the other great stuff you guys have been doing on um, helping us you know, enable this exercise in radical transparency and biotechnology and share kind of our experience of how we are trying to generate this medicine, not just the cool moments, but also the frustrating parts and kind of just let people see that like, it's not all like, you know, cackling, people behind biotech. It's people who really care, like all my team members that I'm so impressed by that like are working hard and are, you know, sort of over surmounting frustrations and obstacles to have these molecules push closer and closer to uh, where they can treat patients and make a difference. So I just want to thank you for being, helping us be that voice. Yeah, it's, um, it's been an absolute privilege. I mean, having RJ here in the, in the studio with me, um, I think the most amazing thing about all of this has been that we've been able to accomplish this, you know, with you guys being in, in California and us, uh, being over here on, on the East coast kind of, well, not even the coast, you know, we're in the Midwest here in Ohio. So being able to, to push out all of this and focus, like you said, on that radical transparency to get as much information out as possible, um, has been absolutely beautiful. And with you know, leveraging the power of the internet is something that, is severely underestimated. Um, but with with that type of technology, uh, combined with the types of brains and the passion that you guys have at Distributed Bio and Cenevax, it's going to be unstoppable. It's been absolutely beautiful to watch. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, we are going to try to make these things be regularly on a weekly occurrence. So we'll schedule this now and figure out who the next group of people are that come in. And again, the kind of the goal is I kind of want you to get to meet all the voices of the people that make all this work possible. So we'll be rotating out themes. I've been trying to show up each time to kind of moderate, but eventually, you know, I'm taking a seat that somebody else could sit in. So we'll take some turns on that as well. Um, so we'll, as soon as we can, we'll come up with what the topic area is. Um, ideally, it, it might be hamster related. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I guess no matter what, we'll talk about the hamsters um, and, and we'll take it from there. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you.